We're going to talk about singing this morning. Last Sunday, I challenged you to make a joyful noise to the Lord. If you ever wonder where that is, just think Psalms and Century, because it's the first phrase in the hundredth Psalm. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. And I tried to challenge you that that is a command. That's what God tells us to do. He doesn't tell us to do it because he likes singing, although I know he does because he created it. And because the Bible even tells us, did you know the Bible talks about where God actually did sing? Interesting to think about that. So I know God likes singing. We want to talk about that a little bit today because sometimes you may have grown up in a family or maybe you went to a school or maybe you had a teacher or maybe you were in Sunday school or somewhere along the line, you sang your heart out. And somebody said to you something cruel and mean and they lied to you and they said, you can't sing. Now, wait, you may not be able to sing well, but unless you talk always with a monotone, with no pitch, punch, pause, or progress, with no highers, no lowers, and it's just a complete monotone, you can sing. You may not be able to sing well. You can make a joyful noise. That's what we want our church to be. We want, if, as it were, that if somebody walks in this place and they've never been here before, we've got folks like that today, I don't think... Now, Stu, was Gabe here before or just Stu? Just you. So we got at least one person here that's never been here before. Uh, and, and, and I hope if there's anything that makes an impression on him beyond the word of God and, and, and uh, you know, the worship of the Lord, if there's anything about us that makes an impression upon a first-time visitor, it'd be, wow, they really sing. Why? Why? Why do we sing? Some would say, well, it's just kind of to get ready for the sermon. I reject that thinking. Well, it's just kind of prelude to the really important stuff. Word of God. There are those that believe that, teach that. Well, I don't agree with that. We emphasize singing. I'd like to read a text to you. It's just nine verses, but I'd like to read the entire psalm. And I hope it could stir our hearts as we begin to think specifically about this idea of singing. Because perhaps one of my, certainly one of my favorite verses in the Bible about singing and music is in this text, and I'll show you why after I read it all. This is the Word of God, Psalm 47 says, Oh, clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. Why? For the Lord Most High is terrible. That is, he inspires terror, the fear of God. He is a great king over all. All the earth. Do you believe that? He shall subdue the people under us and the nations under our feet. He shall choose our inheritance for us, the excellency of Jacob, whom he loved. God is gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises unto our king. Sing praises for God is the king of all the earth. Sing ye praises with understanding. God reigns over the heathen. God sits upon the throne of his holiness. The princes of the people are gathered together, even the people of the God of Abraham, for the shields of the earth belong unto God. He is greatly exalted. So what do you think is my favorite verse about singing in that psalm of nine verses? Well, I think it's probably really obvious. There's one verse, and only one, that uses the word sing four times. <laughs> well, look at it. It's verse 6, sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises unto our king. Sing praises. Now, I want to ask this question. Why? What is the basis for that singing? Why does God say, do this, do this, do this, do this, in one verse? Well, the next verse tells us. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises unto our king. Sing praises, for God is the king of all the earth. Sing ye praises with understanding. When a former president of the United States gets shot, we can question if God is the king of all the earth. And I'm not going to get political here. I don't care where you come down politically. Well, I guess I do care. I I do care. But that's not the point. That is an attack on this nation. That's what that is. He's not just a person. There's a title. He's a figurehead. 
He's, he, he represents something in our history. Now, we have to ask ourselves the question, is God the king? Is he the king of all the earth? The Bible declares that he is. And it is at such a time where this or 911 or any number of national catastrophes and dilemmas and conflicts that the people of God have the opportunity, and only the people of God do, but the people of God have the opportunity, should they choose to put faith in God's word, they have the opportunity to rise above national and any other earthly thing, whether it's a positive thing like golden dreams and golden fancies, or it's a negative thing like, name whatever you like, the civil war, racial injustice or abortion, or whatever else. The believers, the children of God, have the opportunity, should they choose, have the opportunity to rise above that in their hearts and focus their hearts on the stability of God's kingdom. We concluded the message last week. We actually, we started with this and then concluded with it. The last verse, next to the last verse in Hebrews chapter 12, that says, we have an enduring kingdom. We have a kingdom that cannot be moved. But not on this earth, gang. No, not on this earth. On this earth, things are fluid and things change all the time. And I mean, if you're my age, you look back and say, where in the world, how did we get here as a nation? But God never changes. If you're a believer, you have the opportunity, should you choose to put your faith in God's word. You as a believer has the opportunity to recognize I'm part of a kingdom that shall not be moved. I mean, that, that's not just a stone. That's not just a rock. That's not just a cliff. That is bigger than the earth. We have a God we can rest upon, say. So you can be stable. You can be secure. You can be fixed by trusting in our good God. Now, let me get to this subject of singing. We emphasize singing in this church. Why? Let me say this. I mean that we emphasize singing in contrast with music. I want you to get that. We emphasize singing in contrast with just music. And I'm saying that because I believe you may disagree, and that's fine. I hope you don't. I'm going to try to establish this today. But, but I believe that there is a really significant danger that is in many, many churches today where the emphasis is on music in contrast with singing. I wonder if you have any idea where in the world I'm going and why I'm, why I'm even saying that. How can you emphasize singing in contrast with music? Like, what's the difference? Well, let me try to explain what I mean. We emphasize singing together as a church. That is, we emphasize full participation that, that every voice is raised to the glory of God. Every voice is raised to the glory of God. That all of us come together as, as the people of God, called out from hell bound, call, called out from just this world bound, just earth dwellers, earth bound, and that we come together as the people of God that are called away from all of just merely that, although we still live here, but called away from just that groveling, for this life, and called to a higher level of being seated in Christ in heavenly places, accepted in the beloved, having all that we need for life and godliness on this planet as we put faith in what God says and live according to what the Bible says. We, we aim for everyone who has that experience to lift their hearts and to lift their voices. We never say to anybody, even in the choir, we never, I've never said to anybody, listen, would you, you, you just can't sing. You, know, you, you, you don't make a sound as good as I'd like. I never say that. Now, I don't ask them to sing solos either. You okay with that? I mean, we understand. Okay, right? Uh, I, I don't think it would be a good idea to ask somebody who uh, can't speak reasonably good English to, um, sorry about this. Anyway, I, I, wouldn't be, I don't think it would be a good idea to, to, to ask them if they would preach the sermon. I don't think it'd be a good idea to have a person that can't read really well, no criticism, but it wouldn't be a good idea to ask them to, you know, to, to, to read the, the Bible from the pulpit. 
In the same way, we want to be careful with that. We want to recognize giftedness. We want to recognize experience. We want to recognize quality of, of voice or whatever. But we emphasize full participation. Everybody singing. In contrast with just music. Here's the danger that I see. There are many churches today, they're passionate about trying to create this sense that we're different. I know a church in this area. Some of you will know exactly what I'm talking about. They have advertised for years with a big banner outside their property. This church is for a church or for people who, who uh, quit going to church or never went. Something like that. This, this, this church is for people who, who gave up on church or who, or who never went. Now, there's a sense in which that's kind of like pretty cool. Gave up on church, come on with us. You never went, come on with us. But what can happen? I don't know that church specifically, so I, I just want to be careful with that. But the problem with the advertisement is we can focus on reaching people to such an extreme that we forget who we are and what we're doing here. We come here to sing praise to the king of all the earth. Not just to make people happy. Not just to make people encouraged. We're not interested in some kind of a psycho babble thing where, where, you know, yeah, well, I know the Bible says this, but you just need to chill on that, Dan. I mean, just don't, don't certainly don't emphasize that. I mean, come on, Dan. You think, you think people that don't like to sing or that can't sing are really going to like to be chided and admonished that they should sing? You, think, you really think it's wise to, 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 to preach on giving money? Serving God? Reading the Bible? Let's not say every day. Let's say multiple times every day, you know? Yeah. I, I, I think that that's what the Bible says. Years ago, I don't know if I've ever told this story here, but I'll just tell you very quickly. I had a gentleman come as a speaker in our church. This is before I was here, I don't know, maybe 40 years ago by now. Probably more than that, actually. No, it wouldn't be more than 40. But way back, he's a guest speaker. We got in a conversation. And that conversation was about something about which I believe the Bible is crystal clear. But as we talked about it, and we talked about what the Bible says, he said these words to me. He said, you will never build a big church with that kind of a belief. And I said, some things are more important than big churches. Now, you get to choose whether you believe that or not. But that's clearly the Bible teaching. We need to find out, are we going to be God-centered, God-focused, God-driven, whatever we do to alter the glory of God? Or are we going to say, we want more people? And so we're going to compromise what we do and fashion what we do so, so, that, so that the Bible is not too dominant here. You know, it's a good book. It's a good book. But, but we don't want to really be, be dominated by the Word of God. I mean, even though Jesus is the Lord, it's like we don't want to go too far on that. That's not me. And I, I don't think that's you either, of course. We emphasize singing together as a church. Full participation. And I'll just say that in contrast with this... this very significant, I'd call it a fad, although it's been lasting, of, of not wanting a pulpit like this. Certainly not a choir. Where you walk into the building or you see online, and what do you see? You know where I'm going. What do you see? You don't see the picture of God's authority. You don't picture that the focus is on the, the giving out of the Word of God. Rather, what you see is Instruments, and the instruments are not the problem. You see microphones, and at some point some people come up, and they stand up here, and they sing with a microphone. Now, I'm going to ask you this question. Is it wrong to sing? Of course not. Is it wrong to sing with a microphone? Of course not. Is it wrong to have a, a you know, I mean, would it, would it be wrong if this instrument was here instead of there? No, of course not. But the emphasis can become the ones who are on the platform. I don't agree with that. I believe the emphasis needs to be on God. 
Now, does that mean everybody that ever has somebody stand up here with a microphone is wrong? No, because if it did, it'd mean that we were wrong with what, what our brother did this morning. He's saying here with a microphone. He didn't need it. I wish he'd heard me that. Merlin, you could tell him that. He's got a strong, strong voice, and he sings out, and he really did sing with all his heart. What's the problem with what often is called a praise team today? What are the dangers that I see? And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I want to get to the text of Scripture. What's the difference? Well, a praise team consists of specific and chosen musicians on the stage to lead the congregation. Oftentimes, a praise team is such that the amplification is so loud that even if people sing, you can't hear it. This is reality. This is a reaction, listen to me, not with everybody, but with those who started this. They make no apology. This is a reaction to the idea that people don't sing. And so we kind of cover that by getting others to sing. And, and with some, the idea is, well, if others sing with a mic, then, then some that are there that aren't singing, they might, they might learn the song and they might, they might join in because they, they feel confident that they're not going to be heard so much, or that sort of thing. That's the idea. That's the thinking. I, I'm not making this up. Now, there's lots of lemmings that just follow in, as that's just the way it is with, with our culture in all kinds of areas, and, and with humanity. Uh, often, not just amplified sound, but lights. You go to, you go to churches, and, and, it, and it's not lit like this. Why do we want it lit like this? Because I want you to be able to put your eyes on black ink on white paper. We want you to see this. We're not trying to create some kind of a mood. We're not trying to create some kind of a some kind of an atmosphere like, like, like you can see in some churches that go that direction. When there's a praise team, it really can lend itself to the sense of performance. We don't want performance here. What we want is ministry. These are subtle changes. I'm, I admit that these are subtle differences. And I'm not suggesting that every team, church that has a praise team somehow is apostate. I'm not saying that at all. But there's a danger here that we need to be aware of, I believe. Performance instead of ministry. Where it's about the performer. Listen, I think, I trust, he came back. I think if you talk to Kingston today and you were to say to him, that was a blessing to me, or thank you for singing that or something like that, I think he would probably say, Kindly, graciously, humbly, I think he'd say something like, well, thank you. But he didn't sing about himself. You are always good. No offense, but he's not. Right? I'm not always good. Well, we come together as a group and we turn our eyes upon Jesus, upon him and on his word. That's the kind of music we want. We're not interested in music even where the lyrics are such that you could sing them about Buddha or you could sing about Muhammad or you could sing about Confucius or you could sing about your girlfriend and, and it wouldn't change those lyrics. You'll have to have discernment with what you let into your heart with the kind of music that's out there today where it's all, it's so fuzzy. We want to be as crystal clear, as squeaky clean as we can possibly be. At least that's what I want as I've been the pastor. Uh, we, we, no offense if you, if you say this, but we ne I never call this a stage. You say, well, it is a stage. Why don't I like stage? Because stage is about a play. Stage is about a concert. Stage is about a performance. Well, then why do we have this here? So that you can see me better than this. That's, that's all. It's just visual. I can see you. You can see me. You can see the choir. Whoever sings, you can see our brother as he leads songs. It's just a platform. It's a raised platform. You say, that's a subtle difference. You, you got it. Spot on. That is. But there are reasons why these things are going away. It's a reason why pulpits today in, in a lot of churches, you'll not see a pulpit like this. You, you, might, you might see something like this. But typically, it's going to have something that's see-through. It's going to be plexiglass. That's by design. It is by design to, not with all. Some don't know why others did it. But it's, it's by design that the emphasis is off the preacher and, and authoritative preaching and, and what the Bible says and, and the, the idea that we have to either subscribe to this by yielding to the Lordship of Christ 
or we're in trouble. And it's quite true. I believe that that kind of music emphasis, it can communicate expertise and talent and training over participation. It can affirm being a spectator instead of a participant. It can, it can become almost more like a concert experience and people come and, 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 and they hear the music, but it's, it's more like a concert than worship. And here's the biggest danger that I see. And this is, this is in print. I'm just, you know, this is, it can really be focused on aiming for an emotional response. Getting the congregation jazzed up. You can just listen to this in individual songs where they'll start slow and you just watch it. The, the world has done this forever. You know, the, the modern performers, they, they have this down to a science. Where, where it starts with one kind of a genre, one kind of a feeling, one kind of a nuanced sense. It's calm, and it just builds and builds and builds and builds. Whereas we've known of pagans, of course, where they have all kinds of, all kinds of wickedness acted out on the stage or even among those who are, those who are listening. Guys, we, we've got to be different than that. We don't want to go there or anything even close to that. Our focus is on full participation in the singing. Our goal is not to have an emotional experience. It's not to get just people jazzed up. It's, it's not a matter of, okay, you know, all week we kind of go through all the difficulties and the drudgeries and, and the struggles, and then we, we come to church to get a pep pill. We kind of pay our dues because it's kind of like our therapy session. That's our culture. That is not biblical worship. Next week I aim to come back and build on this on the subject of okay, what is worship? What does the Bible tell us about worship? Because the Bible is clear that every person worships. But God only accepts some worship. We'll look at that and see what it says. Our goal is, is to think, not emote. Our goal is to, is to carefully think about what does God say and how does that apply to my life? Not just have a cheerleader flag-waving type uh, patriotic rally or theological rally. What we want is to carefully take the words of God that are forever settled in heaven and compare what God says and who God is. We want to compare that with who we are and how we're doing at that. And to recognize, as our brother sang, I, when I look within, I see my frailties. I see my weakness. But you always hold me. That's the idea as we sing to our God. Our goal is to exalt Jesus. Our goal is to deflect attention from the musician. When was the last time you heard me stand in this pulpit and talk about some soloist and, and talk about a good job that they did? I just, I just don't do that. I don't, I, we don't focus on the people. We want to focus on the God. This is the means to that end in and my, and my belief. Our goal, our objective, is not that for people when they leave to be all jacked up, all emotionally just, just really excited and really positive and really optimistic and really all that. That's not our goal. The goal is not that emotional high. The goal is holy living. The goal is that, not that we feel better, but that we live better. That's the goal. That's God's goal. That's why we should come together. Now, I, I'd like to read some scripture to you. Where, where God tells us to sing. I read several there in Psalm 47. I've got a few more. I'd tell you how many, but I don't want you to count them and zone out. God tells us to sing. All of us. Exodus 15 and verse 21. That's the last reference I'll give you because I've got a, different references here. I'll just read the scripture. But listen to this. Miriam. Remember Miriam? That was Moses' sister. Myriad, Miriam answered them, Sing ye to the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. Well, you know what she was talking about. Here's another one. Sing unto him. Sing psalms unto him. Talk ye of all his wondrous works. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Show forth from day to day his salvation. 
Sing praises to the Lord, which dwells in Zion. Declare among the people his doings. Sing unto the Lord, O ye saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. Praise the Lord with harp. That's our harp right there. <laughs> we don't pluck it, but it's, it's a stringed instrument. Praise the Lord with harp. Sing unto him with psaltery and an instrument of ten strings. I think that has 88, doesn't it? 88 keys, 88 strings, yeah. Uh, I, I, anyway, okay, don't correct me on that if you know music better than I do, because some of you really do. Here, how about this one? Sing unto him a new song. Play skillfully with a loud noise. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises unto God. Our God. Sing praises. Have you heard that before today? I just read it to you. I just read it in Psalm 47. Four times. Sing. God is the king of all the earth. Sing ye praises with understanding. Sing forth the honor of his name. Make his praise glorious. Sing unto God. Sing praises to his name. Extol him that riseth upon the heavens by his name, Jah, and rejoice before him. Sing unto God, ye kingdoms of the earth. Oh, sing praises unto the Lord. Sing aloud unto God our strength. Make a joyful noise unto the God of Jacob. Oh, sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the earth all. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Sing unto the Lord. Bless his name. Show forth his salvation from day to day. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all the earth. Make a loud noise and rejoice and sing praise. Sing unto the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the voice of a psalm. Sing unto him. Sing psalms unto him. Talk ye of all his wondrous works. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praises unto his name for its pleasant. How about this one? Sing unto the Lord with thanksgiving. Sing praise upon the harp unto our God. Listen, listen, listen. What happens to a believer that ignores what God says when he tells us over and over and over and over again? What happens to a believer that ignores what God counsels us to do? Nothing good. God doesn't tell us to do this because he likes singing, although he certainly does. God tells us to do this for our sakes. That we would honor him and that we would bless each other. But that's not all the verses. I'm going to read some more. Listen to this. Praise ye the Lord. Sing unto the Lord a new song in his praise in the congregation of the saints. Sing unto the Lord for he hath done excellent things. Excellent things. And this is known in all the earth. Take a harp. Go about the city. Thou harlot that has been forgotten. Can you imagine? God's talking about somebody here who is, who is, who is not, who has a bad background. Take a harp. Go about the city. Thou harlot that has been forgotten. Make sweet melody. Sing many songs that thou mayest be remembered. Because God changes people. He's really good at that. Awake and sing, ye that dwell in the dust. <laughs> Talk about dead people. For thy dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. In that day sing, ye unto her. Sing unto the Lord a new song in his praise from the end of the earth. Ye that go down to the sea and all that is therein, the isles and the inhabitants thereof. O oh, ye heavens, no, no, sing, O oh, ye heavens, for the Lord hath done it. Shout, ye lower parts of the earth. Break forth into singing, ye mountains, O oh, forest, and every tree therein. For the Lord hath redeemed Jacob and glorified him in Israel. How about this one? Sing, O oh, heavens. Be joyful, O earth. Break forth into singing, O mountains. For the Lord hath comforted his people and will have mercy upon his afflicted. Break forth into joy. Sing together, ye waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord hath comforted his people. He hath redeemed Jerusalem. I'm almost done. Sing, O barren. Thou that didst not bear. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, thou that didst not travail with child. For more are the children of the desolate 
than the children of a married wife, saith the Lord. All these different reasons to sing. Listen to this. Sing unto the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Why? For he hath delivered the soul of the poor from the hand of evildoers. Thus saith the Lord. Sing with gladness for Jacob and shout among the chief of the nations. Sing, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all the heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion. For lo, I come. And I will dwell in the midst of thee, saith the Lord. <laughs> Remember this passage, we'll get to this, and I think next Sunday. In our Bible reading in James, chapter 5 and verse 13. It says, is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Sing psalms. Our brother asked us today, before we started singing, about that, I think it was the last phrase of that first song, I forget, but... Uh, where, where it says, and now I am happy all the day. You remember our brother mentioned that? And now I'm happy all the day. Are you happy all the day? I thought, well, it's my goal. <laughs> it's my goal. It's my birthright. But you know what? I want you to be happy here. Not because you're propped up with, 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 with cotton candy. Not because you're propped up with, with smoke and mirrors. I want you to be propped up because you hear and know and understand in growing what God has told us through his word. And you know that. And you build your lives on it. We long to not sin. But that's longing for heaven. We, white, or we, we long for no murders. That's longing for heaven. We long for everything to be right and nothing wrong, but that's longing for heaven. And if you trust Christ as your Savior, one day you'll get there. We're not there yet. Right now we're in a war zone. Right now we're in a battle. Right now there is a devil and the world and your flesh that don't want you to live for God. One of the valuable, valuable helps to living for God is to sing these truths, not just hear them. But to sing them. Christ is sufficient. Nothing I've done could merit God's grace. Nothing I'll do can, can, can take it away. Oh, we need to sing these extraordinary truths that are based in the word of the living God. I'll just end with one last little comment. One last point. It's more than a comment. Many churches today, you watch this, you'll check this out. Many churches today call the music the worship. That is described as the worship. Oftentimes there is more time given to that worship than there is to the word of God. Absolutely backwards in my view. Not the way it's always been. What is there about our churches about our Christians, about our preachers, about our preaching, about our culture, about our society. What is there that somehow indicates theologically, biblically, we're on the right track? Many a church has given up prayer meeting. Why? Same reason that many a church has given up Sunday night service. Why? Because people don't come. Well, since when do we decide what we do based on what people want? We want to decide based on what God declares. I'm not suggesting that it's sinful to not have a Sunday evening service. That's not what I'm suggesting. I am suggesting that when we have a choice to watch a ball game or to eat dinner or to go to fill in the blank, rather than be with the people of God that should be our most precious people on this planet to us, far more than some... Mom or dad or son or daughter or brother or sister or cousin or work coworker or anyone else that has common interest, but not Christ. Not Christ. We come to love and worship him. We come to seek his face. There are those that distinguish between worship and the sermon, but the Bible makes no such distinct distinction. This preaching better be about worshiping God. If not, it's a bad sermon. It should be Christ centered. Bible-exalting, Christ-exalting, Bible-saturated. Think about it. When we sing, we're singing to God in 
preaching. God's doing the talking. A lot of folks like singing, like music, and not like the preaching so much. That's a big problem. I'm not saying you're like that. I, I hope you're not. Preaching, God is the one who does the speaking. And we listen to him, not just a preacher. True worship, biblical worship, we ask the question, what would you have me do? What do you want, God? What do you want in our service? What do you want in my life? What do you want? That's true worship. That's biblical worship. And God helping us, we'll come back to that next, next Sunday. Let's stand together, please. We'll pray. We won't take time to sing again. But I would love to just say, let's, let's just sing. I love to sing. I didn't love to sing before I got saved. No, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't get saved until I was 18. I liked music a lot. The wrong kind of music. It fashioned my life. But man, when I got saved, you know what happened? I got a song. I got a new song. I got a new Savior. I love him. I do not sing well. I give it my best shot. And I don't have a lot of music training. I never had music training in, in like college or anything. I had I, fourth grade to ninth grade, I played the trumpet. I gave it up because you couldn't play football and be in the marching band in 10th grade. What a stupid decision that was. Anyway, we, 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 we played trumpet in heaven, I think. We certainly have music in heaven. There's not going to be any football in heaven. I don't think. Singing. We're going to pray in a moment. Do you sing? Do you love to sing? Do you love to sing about Jesus? When we're here, do you sing from your heart? If God were to give you a grade on your singing, let's change that. If somebody who sits around you were to give a grade on your singing, would they say, wow, they really mean it. They're singing from their heart. I mean, they're giving it their heart. This is from the Lord to them. They don't care who's listening. They don't care who sings. This is between them and God. That's what we want. Every single one of us. To worship the Lord with our voices in song and lifting our praises to him. The music better be worship. But that's not the only worship. Let's pray.